Let's go ahead and pray. Our Father, uh, we thank you for today. Thank you for your blessings and your grace and mercy to us. We love you and we praise you. Now, precious Holy Spirit of God, give us uh, illumination this morning, understanding of the word. Give us wisdom to apply the word in our lives, especially in these days that we're living in. Now, Holy Spirit of God, we ask for your anointing upon the word and upon the messenger, and we'll give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thinking again on lines of all that we're going through and what's happening, and what we're facing in 2021 is going to be another new year. It's going to be another year of the unknown, another year of uncertainty, and certainly we're facing that. And with that brings a lot of stuff. And so uh, I was reading on something and, and came across it and was something talking about relationships and how important relationships are and that we have to build a foundational relationship. Our relationships have got to have a foundation to them. If we do not have a good foundation, we're not going to have a good relationship. And there are three main relationships in the scripture. First and foremost relationship is with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's first and priority in any believer's life is his relationship with the Lord and building that relationship. Relationship is something you have to build. You have to grow and you have to build it. And it's not just say, well, I got saved, so I have a relationship. No, you just got saved. You haven't built and developed a relationship with Christ yet. That comes through growth and years of growth and maturity and obedience. Uh, of building that relationship with Christ. So that's first and foremost. The second relationship the Bible talks about and discusses is the family. The relationship of the family. Husband and wife first, then parents and children, and then of course grandchildren and great-grandchildren and down the line in our immediate families. And again, if you're going to have a strong family, a strong marriage, uh, a strong relationship, you have to build it. You have to work at it. You've got to build on it. And you've got to have a good, solid foundation. Because if not, the rains and the winds and the storms are going to come and they're going to blow and they'll blow your house down. If they're not built on a solid foundation. And then the third foundation, believe it or not, is the church. The Bible speaks very much about a foundation of the church, of building a relationship with the local church, with a body of believers that we have right here. Uh, and that. So we're going to start tonight, to this morning, and I got to hurry because it took 10 minutes on the missionary. So bear with me. We got to go quickly because to, to part one this morning, part two tonight. Part two tonight in, in the evening service, PM service, will be on foundational relationships. So in Psalms 11 in verse 3, the Bible tells us if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now think about the foundation of America. The foundation of America is being destroyed rapidly and quickly. So what can the righteous do? And then in Psalms uh, chapter 127, verses 1 through 5, let's read that and turn to that, please, very quickly. Psalms 127, verses 1 through 5, and uh, let's take a look and see what it says. Everybody in Psalms 127, verses 1 through 5. There's only five verses in that psalm. All right, so follow along with me as we talk about foundational relationships this morning. All right, and we already discussed the three. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Now, I'm talking about a house, you're talking about this house, the house of God, in your house, in any relationship. If God has to build your relationship in your marriage, in your home, your family, if not, then you're laboring in vain. Okay? Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman uh, waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate." So the psalmist gives us a couple of things here in these verses about, first of all, our relationship with the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, we're laboring in vain. And then he talks about the relationship of parents and children. All right, so we're talking about a family relationship here. So there are three. We looked at them in your outline. And so follow along with me. Relationships uh, with God and the local church often start in the family. 
So goes the family, so goes the church. So goes the family, so goes America, a nation. It's just that simple, and it's proven itself, as was the case for Timothy. So let's take a look at Timothy here real quick. Timothy had a mother and a grandmother that were very godly, and, and they trained him, and they taught him in the scriptures, and so he had a good uh, background. But who taught him? It wasn't the school that taught him, and it wasn't the church that taught him. Who taught him was his parents, his mother and his grandmother. In 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 6, the Bible says, When Paul's talking about, When I call to remembrance the unfreed faith that is in thee, which dwelleth first, notice, in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put you into remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting on of my hands. That was the laying on of hands, approval of, of Timothy in the ministry of the faith that he had that was in him that his grandmother and mother had built in him and given to him through the scriptures. So again, that responsibility of the parents is to teach the scriptures to the children. Your children aren't going to have a solid foundation if you do not teach them the word of God. And you do not build that on the word of God. There are three gifts that we should impart to our families as parents. Grandparents. Okay, Three gifts. First of all, number one, the teaching of scripture. As parents and grandparents, we are responsible for teaching the scripture to our children. Talking about building relationships. And by the way, it doesn't matter how old your children are. You still have a relationship with them. And you're still building a relationship with them, even in their uh, adult age. As long as you're breathing and alive, and as long as they're breathing and alive, uh, you still have responsibility to them. Uh, did you know that even as a child, if you're here today and your parents are still alive, you have a responsibility to be obedient to your parents? Even though you're an adult, Children, obey your parents. That doesn't stop just because I become an adult. You know, I'm still responsible. Of course, my mom and dad have already gone, been gone for a long time. And my grandparents have all been gone for a long time. So the father I had was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other fathers I had were good godly men in our church that took me under their wing uh, when I had no parents and basically raised me and they taught me the word of God. And they lived the example in front of me in my life as a junior boy and girl, and especially as a teenager after I'd lost my mom and my dad went his way. And I relied on these men. Uh, they were my fathers. You know, they were my spiritual father, was my pastor. My youth director was like a, well, he was more of a brother to me, a good brother. And, and other, my Sunday school teachers, and of course some of you will know where I came from, where I grew up in, my training union teachers back in the old days when the Southern Baptists were good and solid and conservative, all right? Uh, wish they would go back to that. Uh, and so they were my, par they were my parents, and, and they trained me in the word, and that's where I am at today because of that. Had it not been for them, I would not be sitting here. All right, so first of all, it has to be personal to the parents. See, teaching the scriptures class has to be personal to you as an adult. See, if it's not personal to you, how are you going to teach your children? How are you going to teach your young adults that are, that are older now? If it's not personal to you. See, if you don't make the scripture personal to you, how are you going to teach it to anybody else? See, that's the same way with me right here. I have to make this personal to me first before I can teach it and share it to you. Okay? So it has to be personal to, par to parents. So in other words, you have to have a relationship with God as a parent. If you're going to build a strong relationship with your children, you got to have a personal relationship with Christ. Okay? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, Jesus said on his Sermon on the Mount, which we're going to be getting into here before long. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, out of Deuteronomy chapter 6 here. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as faultless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Wow. As a parent, you better know the Word of God and study the Word of God. You have a responsibility to know this book. 
And you have a responsibility to teach it to your children. When? All the time. You read that verse all the time. Where? Everywhere. Sitting down, lying down at the gates, at the door, going out. You ought to be talking about the Lord. You ought to be talking about the Word of God and the Scriptures and, and, impl- and impounding that into their little minds and their older minds. <laughs> you know, adults need it just as much. Adult children need it just as much as the little children. We don't leave them just because we become teenagers. We don't drop them off because they're 21 now. You're legally an adult. You can vote now at 18. You can drive a car now. You can get a license. And if you're 21, you can own a handgun. So I don't need to teach you anymore. Go, go your way. No, can't do that. All right, so first of all, what I have to do, I have to have a personal relationship with Christ myself. And the Word of God teaching the Scriptures has got to become personal to me. Secondly, there's a personal love for the Lord. As a parent, you need to have a personal love for the Lord. Apart from any relationship with other people or any church. That means he comes first before anybody. Before anybody. Keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, King Solomon said. Again, this is one of the six times this is quoted in the Bible. Three in the old, three in the new by Jesus. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That is the first and greatest commandment. And that's quoted three times in the Old Testament. Jesus quoted it three times in the Gospels. Okay? So that means God comes first in your relationship. How are you going to have a a solid biblical foundation with your children if you don't have one with God first? So you've got to get to the place of thinking, Lord, the guys and gals in here this morning, that Christ is the one. He's the one that has done everything for you. He's the one that's given you everything. He's the one that's forgiven you. He's the one that died for you. He's the one that shed his blood for you. He's the one that's wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's the one that's given you heaven. He's the one that's adopted you in sonship. Not your family. Nor did the church. The Lord Jesus Christ did all of that. And so much more. Then I need to have a personal walk, number two, with the Lord every day. See, teaching the scriptures has to be personal to me as a parent. There has to be a personal love for God. Then there has to be a personal walk with the Lord every day. Listen to what Psalms 86, 11, and 12 says. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify thy name forevermore. Genesis 17, 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Wow. So I need to have a personal walk with Christ. Because see, how are you and I going to instruct our children and when I use children now, okay, I'm talking about my daughters are 48, 47, 46, 5. They're still my children. And I have grandchildren. And before long, I don't know when, but I may end up being a great-grandfather before Jesus comes. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Amen. I don't know how Armin does it. He's a great-grandfather of 100 kids. Oh, Lord, have mercy. So... I've got to have that walk with the Lord first before I can teach it to my children. Before I can ask my children to walk with the Lord. Because see, if I go, well, you know, you all ought to read your Bible and you ought to study your Bible and you ought to walk with the Lord. And they turn around and look at you and go, uh-huh. When have I seen you read the Bible, Mom or Dad? When have I seen you studying the Scriptures? When have I seen you walking, quote, with the Lord? Amen? All right. Thirdly, there must be a personal separation to the Lord. It's distinct from the world. We must be separated from the world, you see, and there has to be a distinction there. Just as God commanded the Israelites. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says what? Paul said, come out from among them 
And be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And God says, I will be a father unto you and receive you. Leviticus 20, 33. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation, which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. I detested them. They were detestable to me. And you have to go back and read Leviticus 20, 23, and read all the things he was talking about, the way they were living their life, the way they were walking, acting, and carrying on. And God says, I abhor that. I detest that. What's in our lives that God abhors today? As he watches us in our so-called walk with the Lord. Would there be anything in there that the Lord would be displeased with? That the Lord would abhor or he would be, it would be detestable to him? He detests it in our lives? Well, things we got to think about. All right? So we got to teach the scriptures. Amen? It's got to be personal to us. Well, then we have to present it to the children. Now we've got to present this to the children. Now that i got that kind of taken care of and it's down to pattern, now it's time to, the application, put it to practice. I've got to present these things to the children, what I just talked about. All right, look at Joshua 24, 15. You know that. You've heard it many times. You know what's been going on with the nation of Israel all this time under Joshua's leadership. All the victories and the battles they had, and yet they're coming down near the end, and what are they doing? They're still running wild, living wild, going nuts and crazy. And Joshua comes along and says, now, if it seems evil to you, Israelites, I could see old Joshua standing up there and shaking his rod at him, Moses' his rods, you know. He's up on the rock, you know, over up there talking to him, because he's their pastor, he's their leader. He says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, you Israelites, then you choose this day whom you're going to serve. You make a choice, he said. You're either going to serve the gods which your father served uh, where on the other side of the flood. And talking about the other side of the flood, he's not talking about the flood of the world. He's talking about the flood of the Jordan River, okay? Uh, where they were on the other side, okay? Or the gods of the Amorites, whose land that you now are dwelling in. But as for me and my house, that's my kids, it's my parents, you know, as a parent. We're going to serve the Lord. And, of course, we know the story. The next verse, Israel says, you know, we will serve the Lord with you, Joshua. We're going with you. Well, that lasted for a little while. Then they went right back into their old ways again. And Boy, have you ever seen an example of a nation of a people? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's, there it is, boy. I mean, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, in and out, in and out. I mean, we, we could make a song up for Israel with that. You know, and so forth. But I've got to present it to the children. So here we go. Let's talk about presenting to the children. What am I going to present as a father, as a grandfather today? What am I going to present to my children? First of all, I've got to have a faith to present to them. Especially in the times and the days we're living in. Don't be presenting fear to them. You need to be presenting faith to them. A faith that you have. Your faith. That you've developed for yourself. Do you have a faith today that you've developed? Then you need to present that to your children. Okay? Children should know your relationship with God is a priority in your life. It's a priority in your life. You can't go around telling God that your kids that she's a priority of your life. And then every time something else comes up, boom, you're gone. And you're out doing this and doing that and going here. That, that's not teaching your kids that, that, that God and your faith is a priority in your life. And you wonder sometimes how you can't reach them. All right? You need, secondly, you need to have a faith. You need to share it with other believers. Developing traditions that can comfort you during bad times. We're going through some dark days right now. Bad times. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let what? What is the word? It's called the Bible. Let the Bible dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's what we're doing here today. That's what we're going to do. Because you know what we're doing here today, church? We're building relationships. And those relationships or foundational relationships have got to be built on the Word of God. It has to be built on the faith of the Word of God. 
not on everything else. Okay? So that's what we're doing. All right, so then if I'm going to present this to my children, I better have a testimony, a testimony of moderation. Okay? Number two, a testimony of life. First of all, number one, we need to teach the scriptures. Number two, a testimony of life. And that testimony ought to be one of moderation. Number one, the teaching of children is a responsibility of the parents, not the school, and not the church. We'll take all the kids they want to send us, but it's not, and some of you may have grown up this way, and you've seen it in churches before. You see the parents drive up, kick the kids out, and off go the parents, and leave it to the church to teach the children. Now, I thank God that's how it happened in my life. My grandmother and my aunt, there's my Eunice and Lois in my life, took me to church as a little goober. And I used to sit right here on the front row. They sat back there a little ways. Miami Shores Baptist Church and Little River Baptist Church. And the preacher would be right there. Pastor Zimmerman was one of them. I can remember his name. And he used to spit at me all the time and shake his finger at me. And I would just sit there and sometimes he'd tell me, son, shut your mouth, you're catching flies. Just staring at him. Taking in every word he said. When I got old enough to ride a bicycle, a 20-incher, put the banana handlebars on it, Put a banana seed on it, you know. And I was a terror of the neighborhood. Our church was Northwest Baptist Church that I started attending with my sister three blocks away from the house. And she would take me there. We'd walk together. She's four years older than me. And then pretty soon, I was on my own. So uh, that is all right if I ride my bike. And walk. And yeah, just be careful of that one way road out there on 135th. Yes, sir. And I would ride my bike to Sunday School and Church every year, every Sunday. Never miss. Didn't go at night. I was only six years old. And, you know, so I, I thank God that the church became my teacher in that sense. But, you know, you've got to have a testimony of moderation. We have to teach the children. It's the responsibilities. And I'm, I'm, I'm saddened, and, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, my parents did not teach me the Word of God. But my church did. And I had other parents there. But my dad never took me, just dropped me off and kicked me out and got rid of me. Went on my own. And he let me go on my own. He didn't forbid that. And I was grateful and thankful for that. Even when I got saved at the age of eight, came home that Sunday morning, and I told my dad that I had trusted Christ and gotten saved, and I said, tonight I'm going to be baptized, if that's all right with you. I want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And he said, that's fine, son, you can be baptized. Yet he and my mom never came to my baptismal. But that's all right. I still love them. And they still loved me. But I'm thankful for, for it anyway. Now, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Grandfathers, provoke not your grandchildren to anger, lest they be discouraged. There are four ways, dads, fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, that we can provoke our children to anger. The first one is, is modeling anger ourselves. If you're an angry person, and angry all the time, and then you don't have your temper under control. And that's going to cause your children and grandchildren anger. You're going to provoke them to anger. The second way we can provoke our children is overprotection. Some of you are overprotecting. You need to slack off a little bit. Give them some rope. Give them a little slack. They're going to grow up. They need to learn. Sometimes they have to learn a little more of a difficult, harder way that, you know, you don't play with this or touch this because you'll get hurt. 
And of course, you know, they're still going to go right out and do it. But don't be so overprotected. You can't put your children in a bubble. Okay? You can't dress them up in a suit, a space suit, and send them out with gloves and boots on and hats and masks and goggles and everything else and expect them to live in the world. You know, you, you have to build. God built us with our hands because he knows our hands touch everything. And we handle everything with our hands. And where do our hands usually go all the time? To our mouth, to our nose. Kids put their hands in their mouth more than anything you can think of. And everything they can pick up on the ground they put in their mouth. Well, God built in an immune system for us to take care of that. He knew that was going to happen. All right? And, and, and you can't, you're not going to keep them from touching and eating things and picking up stuff. Don't worry about it. God's built in them an immune system that will take care of this stuff. My daughter is a phobia on germs. Wears gloves and sprays and ay, ay, ay. Let them go, baby. Don't be so overprotective. No child wants to go out and play with the rest of the kids with a bubble in his, over his head. Nor does he want to walk out of the house in a spacesuit with booties on and gloves on and goggles and masks and all the rest of the kids are running around having a great time. You're going to make him angry. Give him a little slack. Now, of course, the ones who give more slack are grandma and grandpa. Be careful, grandma and grandpa. A third way, ah, playing favoritism. Favoritism for a particular child will cause that child to get angry. You will provoke that child. Don't want to do that. And then don't be a passivity. Don't be passive about everything. Not correcting a child, ah, when they misbehave. The Bible says a rod will drive it far from them. You spoil a child, you see, and spare the rod, you spoil the child. And you'll raise a hellion on your hand. God has that there for a corrective purpose. Don't you become passivity and, then not, and don't correct a child. And especially grandma and grandpa, you're worse at it than the parents are. Number two, the teaching of children should be based on the word of God. The teaching of children should be based on the word of God. Thou shalt teach them diligently. We read that in Deuteronomy 6, 7. Number three, the teaching of children should be consistent with your testimony. It's not do as I say or do as I don't, okay? You need to be consistent with your testimony when you're teaching them. And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Number four, the teaching of children should be a patient and loving, but strict. Talking about building strong foundational relationships with our children. That's missing today. The families, the homes, I mean, you see it everywhere you go. You go in the grocery store, you go to Walmart, I mean, you, you, you get out there, Lowe's, I don't care where you go. I mean, boy, some of the relationships between parents and kids is, is atrocious. And the disrespect and, and the dishonor and, and I mean, the, the nastiness and the filthiness. And I mean, I've seen little ones cussing their parents out in the store. I mean, you just want to grab the daylights out of them and say, boy, I'll knock that out of you right quick. And take him behind the shed and, and spank the daylights out of him. Then go in there. Okay, now you're going to get me for child abuse. I'm sorry, but I'm here today because my father did that. And thank God he did her. I'd be in prison today like a lot of yours are. And serving prison time. And I'd be in drugs and alcohol. And, and you name it. Oh, thank God my dad disciplined me when I needed it. And he did it in love, but he was strict with it. And this filthy mouth stuff. Why do you think they made lye soap? I know, you think it's to take a bath with. Well, there he goes. Boy, that preaches child abuse. Any of you ever get your mouth washed out with soap when you were growing up as a kid? Come on, raise your hand and be honest. Anybody here get a little bar of soap in your mouth? You know, they just take it and do that to you. And, oh, my goodness. You know, oh, you know, I'm telling you, today's Dr. Spock would say I have mental problems because of that. I'm I mentally disturbed that, that, that upset my whole metabolism of my mind and my thinking and, and I'm crippled because of it because uh, my dad put a bar of soap to my mouth for saying something nasty or, or smart back to my mother. Oh, I'm damaged. Hogwash. Hogwash. Said at the dinner table one time I was just a tot. 
Mama said something to me, and I said to her, shut up. I don't know how old I was, six, seven, eight years old, just a little rascal. And the next thing I know, I had joined the circus. <laughs> and I had, I had training in aerobatics tumbling. Because the backhand caught me across the forehead. And I did a backward somersault, landed on my feet, praise God. And I thought, wow, I'm going to become a gymnast. You know what? From that day to this day, even though mama's gone 40 some years, 50 some years, wow, time flies. I never, ever smart mouth my mother again. And by the way, I never joined the circus, but I did take gymnastics. Amen. Bottom of the page. We looked at the testimony of moderation. There's the testimony of admonition. Children need both to be nurtured, positive reinforcement of teaching, uh, usually from the mother, and admonition, that's negative reinforcement, believe it or not, usually from the father. Our nurture can come from uh, either parent. Everyone needs it. Amen? I hear ye, hear ye, uh, children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding, for I give you do good doctrine, and forsake ye not my law. In other words, don't forget God's word. I'm giving, a dad has given his parent good doctrine from the scripture, and don't you forget it. Okay? Admonition can come from either parent, just like a, a, a nurture can. Okay? Uh, so no one develops it without it. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give you delight unto thy soul. Proverbs 29, 17. Tenderness for the lost. Parents, we're teaching our children, and we need to teach them when they're young to have a tenderness for the lost. You know why we got generations today, my generation and my grandkids' generation? Nobody's winning people to Christ. Did we fail to teach them that? We probably did. We did not do the job we needed to do to teach them to have a tenderness for the lost. And the way they're going to do that is they've got to teach them the, re the realization of eternity. Where people are going to spend an eternity. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto men once to die. After that what, church? The judgment. What does that tell you? If you're going to die and then there's a judgment, that means you're going to live again. It's a resurrection. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. He that wins souls is wise. Teach your children to win souls. They'll be wise. Teach them to be tender for the lost. Now they may be saved. And you may have young children, teenage children, adult children that are saved. But what about those that are not? Do they have a tenderness? A burden for souls. Parents, teach your children. I don't care what age they are. Even when they're older, teach them to have a burden for souls. That's so important. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So in our conclusion this morning, we're building a relationship with God first, you and I, as parents, okay, so that we can build a strong foundational relationship with our children, no matter how old they are, and our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren, because we're still parents. We're called a grandparent. We're called a great-grandparent. But we're still a parent, and we have a responsibility and obligation to teach our children. Let your walk match your talk, and your talk match your walk. Okay? In conclusion, the foundations of a good relationship are, here they are, a sure relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. A sure relationship. A strong relationship with your family through biblical teaching. And the last two we just talked about, nurture and admonition. And thirdly, a sure relationship with the local church through friendships developed, now look at this, in a godly environment. That's what we're doing here. And in October... November, December, we were a very busy, active church. We had a lot of things going on and doing. You know what we were doing? We were building 
relationships in a godly environment. That's important. So tonight, part two. You don't want to miss it. It gets more exciting. And I'll get to be in the preaching mode so much not so much in the teaching mode. And we're going to enjoy that. Now, I want you to really be praying for this morning. The Lord has laid on my heart and given us a powerful, I believe, powerful message from the Word of God concerning the times that we're living in and the year that we are facing and getting ready to really launch out into and go that we're all going to need. And I think it's going to be awesome. Not because it's me, but God's Word is awesome and powerful. And you're going to see a tremendous parallel. And you're going to see a tremendous of what's going on and what we need to do. What shall the righteous do if the foundation be destroyed? That's next. Praise God. Father, we thank you for the instructions now that we have been given this morning from your word. As parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and yes, even as adults, we have children that come into our life and we need to have to teach them, to live an example in front of them of everything we talked about. Now, Lord, we've received instruction today. We have been hearers of the word today. Now help us to be doers of that which we've heard. And if we are doers, James tells us, we will be blessed in our deeds and our efforts. And so, Father, we want to be blessed by being obedient to your word of building strong foundational relationships with our kids, our teens, our young adults, our grandkids, our great-grandkids, and yes, with each other right here in the church. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.